So our first presenter is Spencer Corrales, formerly the assistant professor in digital humanities librarian at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and very, very soon to be the director for research and scholarly initiatives at Southern Methodist University Library, researches the ethics of collaboration in humanities research and critical digital pedagogy. The respondent, Ben Brumfield, is a partner at Brumfield Labs, LLC, and is the creator of the open source tool from the page, which many of you might be aware of. He is a software consultant specializing in crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing textual encoding, and linked data for the GLAM sector, and is presented on the intersection of technology, crowdsourcing, and digital editions. So without any further ado, I'll mute myself and hand the floor over to, to Spencer. Thanks, Ryan, and um, thank you to Alyssa and Albert for including me in this event. Um, and thanks to Ben for uh, agreeing to be the respondent today. Um, this is a conversation that Ben and I have been having for many years in different settings. And um, I'm really excited to, uh, to share some of the ways my thinking on this has evolved over the, uh, recently as I've been exploring some new um, sort of theoretical frameworks for the more polemical work that I've done in the past. And, um, and to be engaged in conversation with this really vibrant and important community. Uh, uh, I am Dr. Spencer Corrales. I use they, them pronouns. I am joining you today from the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations here in rural Illinois. Um, in this virtual environment, we must also acknowledge that the infrastructure necessary for an event like this crosses the sacred and unceded lands of many nations. This work emerges from long-term collaborations with Elizabeth Grumbach and Sarah Potvin um, and ongoing conversations with colleagues, including Rafia Mirza, Maura Seal, Tanisha Taylor, and Miriam Posner. Um, my ideas in this are completely shaped by their, my interactions with those, um, those colleagues. Uh, and um, they are very present in the work that I'm sharing today. This work is also deeply indebted to Black womanist thought and the radical traditions of queer and trans liberation and labor activism. And I hope that what I share here today in some way honors my spiritual and intellectual forebears uh, in this work. Um, today, we'll do a little housekeeping and the introduction, which we're already in the middle of. Um, I'll talk a little bit about student labor in the classroom, sort of um, providing a, a framework from my chapter that was mentioned in the previous session. Um, and then I'll talk about what does an inclusive or equitable um, ethical collaboration look like. Um, and then we'll open it up for uh, Ben and discussion. I believe that my remarks will run about 35 minutes. Um, here is a link and a QR code for the shared notes, shared notes document in case you joined after the um, link was shared in the chat. Um, anybody can feel free to, to repaste that for folks who joined a little bit late. So labor. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a campus visit to interview for a DH gig at the University of Alabama. Um, as I was being bounced from job talk to interview to tour, one of my guides bragged about how cool it was that professors would write what he described as the ant work, which like let, we can unpack how offensive that term is in a minute, but, um, but they would write the ant work into a course syllabus and make students do it for them for free without credit or compensation. He went on to describe students doing data entry, TEI markup, and other tasks on faculty research projects and websites, which he said saved the researchers from having to get grant funding and essentially hid the need for the lat labor from the institution. There was no mention of the usual sort of canards like exposure to active research or practical skills. This was explicitly the instrumentalization of student labor to expedite faculty research without having to pay for it. My tour guide made it clear that this was the culture at Alabama and that everyone was in on it. My first thought was, oh, you apparently didn't read my CV. Um, my second thought was, oh, you did read my CV and you're putting me in my place. After all, in my job talk that morning, I had discussed the work I'll summarize here and I'd expressed clearly how I would not be complicit in the exploitation of students in the classroom. I was in effect being told that if I took a job there, I would be complicit and I'd like it and I'd like liking it. 
Um, after another couple of uncomfortable hours and a meeting with the dean that was frankly hostile, um, I headed to the airport in Birmingham. From a barbecue joint on the concourse, um, I sent an email withdrawing from my candidacy, candidacy for the position because after the campus visit and especially that um, conversation, it was clear that this was not going to be a place where I would be successful personally or professionally, where my views and values would not be respected and where I'd be expected to contribute to and support the very practices I had spent my career up to that point decrying. <coughs> it should come as no surprise, I think, that faculty might use student labor to their own ends. This is a common not, but not unproblematic practice in the sciences. And the 2020 Ithaca SNR report supporting research in languages and literature made explicit that many humanities scholars see themselves as entitled to the labor of others, including students, librarians, archivists, and other contributors to help conduct and disseminate their research, even as most scholars do not perceive these co contributions as collaboration. This lack of recognition masks a deeper understanding or an intentional disregard of the rights of others to recognition, credit, and compensation for their contributions to faculty projects. When I bring this up, I've been told that it's just a neoliberal university and we've all got to play along in order to get by or to get tenure and promotion. Um, so what Richard Grusin has described as the bottom line economics and the need for higher education to train students for jobs, not to read literature or study culture. I reject that premise out of hand, especially considering what neoliberalism in the university context denotes. As Grace Hong describes it, neoliberalism emerged as a response to the liberation movements of the post-World War II period, centering economics, particularly the free market and the minimal state, against movements for decolonization, desegregation, and self-determination. The implications of neoliberalism in the university can be seen in the shift toward managing higher ed like a business, the emphasis on career training over liberal education, and the position of often false meritocratic hierarchies in power, access, and mobility within and among institutions that privilege and protect capitalist, white supremacist, and patriarchal norms. So if we're playing along with neoliberalism, these are the things we're accepting as normal. I'd prefer to challenge these things rather than being complicit with them. I believe that if you're not working toward abolition, you're complicit. My interest in advocating for student rights and especially labor rights in digital humanities projects came early in my career as I heard over and over at conferences and other events, faculty cheerfully describe using uncredited and uncompensated student labor in the classroom to complete their projects, often under the rubric of crowdsourcing. I had to think through why exactly I had such a visceral response to these presentations. What exactly was it that felt wrong to me? Um, and through that process, I lobbied for the inclusion of labor as a keyword in the digital pedagogy and the humanities um, concepts, models, and experiments project, and was ultimately invited to curate it for the final publication. Um, I was part of the conversation that produced the Student Collaborators Bill of Rights, and was later invited to contribute a longer essay on the topic to Dorothy Kim and Jesse Stommel's Disrupting the Digital Humanities Collection. Uh, in that essay, I describe a few reasons why crowdsourcing as a model didn't sit well with me in describing the use of student labor in the classroom. Among these is the questions of what are we perhaps inadvertently teaching when we fail to give credit or compensation for student labor? I argue that students learn from us that their labor is alienable and that it's okay for them to alienate the labor of others. Thus, we help create the next generation of labor exploiters. Secondly, in writing this labor into a class, we are compelling students to pay with their tuition dollars and likely student debt for the privilege of working on these projects. This is what I describe as a deficit inter internship and what Jet Jacobs at UCLA more plainly calls a debt internship. Unpaid internships in practica have a significant negative impact on low income students who may already be facing food and housing insecurity. And we know that students of color and LGBTQ students are already disproportionate, disproportionately likely to experience food and housing insecurity. So the debt internship increases inequity, inequity for the most vulnerable among our students. This practice also effectively hides the real cost of doing archival transcription work from the institution and from funding agencies, since we effectively underwrite the costs of these projects with student debt. 
And finally, it bulldozes other institutional collaborators like librarians, IT folks, um, et cetera, into being complicit in student exploitation. Because of their positionality, librarians in particular often do not feel empowered to refuse to projects to participate in projects that deal unethically with student labor, since faculty entitlement preys on the vocational awe of librarians to compel their labor. But finally, what bothered me about the invocation of crowdsourcing in this practice is that crowdsourcing operates under specific conditions of informed consent and volunteerism, um, which labor in the classroom cannot support. Crowdsourcing relies on low to no cost labor to produce a wide variety of products. Um, for from computer code to photography and deploys an instrumentalist ethic toward those conducting their labor. Um, crowdsourcing dehumanizes individual contributors, reducing them effectively and affectively to anonymous components in a networked machine. And we heard in, our pre in the previous session many strategies for mitigating this dehumanization, for making sure that your collaborators, your contributors are recognized and that their labor is honored. Uh, but despite these problems, crowdsourcing relies on a particular social contract between labor and organizer, encouraging a spirit of volunteerism to produce collaborative projects at scale. Crowdsourcing organizers don't have any power uh, to compel participation, and volunteers either show up or they don't, depending on how the project appeals to its community. Conversely, student labor in the classroom is never not coerced. Other critics of student labor in the classroom suggest that alternate assignments could be offered in lieu of project oriented or public facing work. And while this may be possible, I believe that under circumstances where students are expected to work on a professor's project or even given the alternative of working on a professor's project, um, students will feel coerced to participate in the professor's project or that students um, choosing the alternative project will be penalized or at least have the perception of being penalized for not contributing. The power dynamic of the classroom is such that student choice in this situation cannot be unequivocal and that faculty objectivity will always be suspect. In response to specific student concerns about labor exploitation at her institution, Miriam Posner collaborated with her students at UCLA to develop a student collaborator's bill of rights, which articulates these principles quite clearly. It's important to recognize that students and more senior scholars don't operate from positions of equal power in the academic hierarchy. In particular, students DH mentors may be the same people who give them grades, recommend them for jobs, and hold other kinds of power over their futures. So this relationship is never going to be balanced or unequivocal. Uh, while my goal in this work has never been to name names or to point fingers, some of you might uncomfortably recognize yourself in what I'm describing, or if you're a librarian or in other research support roles, you may have been compelled to contribute to projects like these. And I suppose it's entirely possible that your ethical framework sees using the uncredited and uncompensated labor of students as something you're entitled to do. In that case, you can just feel free to tune out now. I don't have much to say to that person. Um, but uh, as the Collective Wisdom Handbook, which I was delighted to see shared in the previous session, describes, doing nothing is a decision that is likely to support the status quo, including existing power structures. So if we're reproducing the hierarchies, inequities, and injustices of higher ed, like um, student labor exploitation, privacy violations, misogyny, racism, queer and transphobia, algorithmic bias, and what Jeffrey Morrow describes as cop shit in our collaborations, we fail to fulfill the radical potential of community inclusive archival projects. How then can, can we recreate collaborations that are inclusive by design? The best way I can imagine is to practice abolition, that is to not use student labor in the classroom. Find other ways to teach these skills and to meet the learning outcomes of, of a course that does not contribute directly to, to a faculty project. Rather, invite students and wider publics to participate in a truly crowdsourced experience. Online volunteer opportunities with clear boundaries and informed consent, maybe with a transcribathon um, in which groups can participate in specific tasks in a structured event. But if there's a clear learning goal involved in bringing this work into the classroom, how can we mitigate the harm done to students? How do we not inadvertently teach them to devalue their labor? 
In what follows, I invite us to envision together a model of collaboration with students and others that acknowledges the diverse perspectives of participants and uses design justice principles to, as Sasha Costanza Chalk describes it, quote, dismantle the matrix of domination and challenge intersectional structural inequality. I posit that we can intentionally create spaces of equity and inclusion um, where collaborative communities can emerge. Victor Papanek argues that design is basic to all human activities. The planning and patterning of any act toward a desired foreseeable end constitutes the design process. Emerging from this fundamental principle, design thinking, also referred to as human-centered design, is a relatively recent development. From its origins in product development, design thinking has evolved to touch on many different fields from architecture to computing, from biz big business to higher ed. My interests here focus on design thinking as articulated by IDEO, one of the primary organizations responsible for the current conception of design thinking as a term of art. In IDEO's model, design thinking is understood as a process and a mindset geared toward problem solving based not just on technology, but on empathy and creativity. Because design thinking has historically been centered in STEM fields like computer science and engineering, um, and because of the strong association of design thinking with big business and neoliberal institutions, academics might be reluctant to adopt design thinking principles or to see the payoff of these methods for human, or, or not to see the payoff of these methods for humanistic knowledge creation. IDEO frames design thinking around a nonlinear collaborative process of inspiration, ideation, and implementation, which in some ways mirrors methods of in critical pedagogy under the rubrics of prototyping, scaffolding, and iteration. While these are key components of design thinking, they're not the full range of methods encompassed by the design thinking process. Um, but what I imagine here is an intentional adaptation of the design thinking principles pioneered by IDEO um, in the field guide to human-centered design for a scholarly context. So inspiration is when we learn how to better understand the challenges that our work is confronting. Um, ideation is where we learn to gener generate ideas, identify opportunities, um, and to try out and polish solutions. This is where the values of constructive failure and iteration happen um, as we learn together and adapt. And finally, implementation. Participants learn how to meet their challenge by bringing the ideas to fruition. Um, this might be a publication, a product, a lesson plan or assignment, an artwork or performance, or any other creative output or mode of scholarly communication. Drawing from uh, Patricia Hill Collins, Costanza Chalk invokes a new form of design that addresses the intersectional forces of oppression and challenges designers to think about how good intentions are not necessarily enough to ensure that design processes and practices become tools for liberation. I argue that applying the principles of design justice to the development and implementation of um, crowdsourced collaborative opportunities has the potential to create collaborations that are non or at least less hierarchical, non-unidirectional, and more holistically experiential. Establishing equitable collaboration as the bedrock of our common practice for project development and community building is essential to manifesting collaborations grounded in justice. The, the design justice principles articulated by the Design Justice Network provide a conceptual scaffolding for this work. Like any manifesto, the principles are broad enough to be adapted to many situations, and we may find opportunities to use these principles um, and articulate these values in our research, in our workplaces, and our service work, as well as in our classrooms. A few of the principles that seem particularly germane to the present conversation include um, that we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, um, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Um, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. We work towards sustainable community-led and controlled outcomes, and we work toward non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. I already heard some of these principles, sort of um, resonances with some of these principles in the preceding session. Um, these are things that we're that that you in this field are already thinking about in ways. And um, my suggestion is that we that the design justice principles provides a sort of framework or a scaffolding for us to proceed intentionally 
um, toward implementing these things as it's part of the bedrock of what we do together. Um, so this is preaching to the crowd in some ways for some of you, but um, for some these principles might feel revelatory. Um, these conceptual frameworks can feel daunting, um, especially when we consider the prospect of retrofitting existing projects to experiment with these ideas. Um, in this case, the principles of design thinking can come in handy because the processes of inspiration, ideation, and implementation are necessarily non-linear. Um, in this context, you can give yourself permission to try things out and abandon them if they fail you, your students, or your wider community of collaborators. Um, so how do we move from the conceptual to the practical? What are some strategies for implementing inclusive collaborations based on this framework? Um, first and foremost, I have to say informed consent must be a design fundamental. Um, and this will involve a significant degree of transparency, especially if you are going to choose to integrate um, this labor into the classroom. So you need to be clear about well, the students' um, labor and intellectual property rights, um, provide them perhaps an opportunity to opt out and participate in an equivalent assignment um, that still provides the same learning outcomes, um, provide some sort of transparency and mechanism around how you will be evaluating them in an equitable way if they choose to not contribute to your project, um, and finally, how um, they're, they'll be credited on the final uh, project. The thing to remember, and I think I put I point this out very strongly in the in the chapter, is that a grade is neither credit nor con compensation. Um, a grade is something arbitrary that's assigned for institutional reasons that doesn't necessarily have any reflection on the quality of student learning. Um, Finally, and then secondly, respecting students' rights at every level. Um, informed consent, again, is a design fund fundamental. Um, in terms of privacy, FERPA should be level zero for how we think about student privacy. Um, it's the absolute bare minimum, just like ADA compliance is not inclusive praxis. It's just the bare minimum that's required by law. And so you require it. So you complied with the law. Do you want a cookie? Like that, that should be the bare minimum that you do in order to um, make your class inclusive and to respect students' privacy rights. Um, you need to know um, and limit if you're able what data is being collected about your students and especially from third party vendors and platforms. Um, and this is something, you know, from, if we've got some folks here who are on the vendor side, um, think really intentionally about what data you're collecting about from your folks that are participating with your platform um, and be really transparent about that with everyone. And that doesn't mean burying it in the legal language of a EULA. Um, if you are, your vendor are using data on student work, workers, go through IRB first. Make sure that it's, you get an exempt ruling or a not human subjects research ruling. Um, from IRB in order to mitigate the risk, not just of institutional liability, which is really what IRB is there to protect, um, but they're actually genuinely um, approaching IRB process in, in the spirit of protecting your collaborators. Um, finally, give like, or not finally, um, give students mechanisms to own their labor and intellectual property. Um, what does authorship look like? What does um, how can they describe their process, their, their, their contribution? Um, can you provide them with language to include on their CV that describes the skills that they're learning in this project? And, and that's for students who are just vol who are volunteering, um, but also for, but especially for students in the classroom or for, or for paid student workers. When I work with um, paid student workers, I always um, provide them with language specifically to their CV um, that describes what they're doing in terms of transferable skills and not merely tasks. And finally, no cop shit, um, borrowing from again from Jeffrey Morrow. This means abolishing any pedagogical technique or technology that presumes an adversarial relationship between students and teachers. Um, and the link is in the citations list in the shared notes document as well as on the screen um, for that really important post. Um, so is transformative justice a lot to ask of collaborative projects? Absolutely. Um, and is it a lot to ask of folks, especially librarians, whose positionality frequently subjects them to, to demands and often unreasonable demands for their time, expertise, and emotional labor, and whose positionality often disempowers them from pushing back on unethical practices um, by people with significantly more institutional power in their systems? Absolutely. But recall, empathy 
is a key principle of design thinking. So extend yourselves and your collaborators the same grace that you have been extending to others, especially throughout the last few years of the pandemic, um, and take seriously the permission that iteration and ideation gives us to experiment and implement at our own pace. So as you consider to adapting, consider adapting your existing project to a design justice framework, um, begin by changing just one thing. For example, implement a process of informed consent if you don't already have one, especially when working with students in the classroom. Be transparent about their roles, the goals of the project, and what they can expect. Be clear that you know they are paying to contribute to your project. Take the time to engage them in dialogue about this and, if possible or appropriate, offer them an alternative assignment that meets the learning outcomes of the class, but for which their labor is their own. Then, next time, do just one more thing. Give yourself permission to try things out and abandon them if they fail you or your collaborators. Design justice offers one means of developing an emergent mode of collaboration based on liberation. I'm inspired by the tradition of critical digital pedagogy long advocated by the, men, the editors of hybrid pedagogy and articulated by the editors and contributors to the Modern Language Association publication, Digital Pedagogy and the Humanities Concepts, Models and Experiments. Uh, I see critical pedagogy as a gateway to the type of collaboration I advocate here. Um, if our intention is to create equitable and sustainable spaces that then, to use the words of Adrian Marie Brown, turn complex systems like the neoliberal university into spaces where we do less harm and generate more freedom, then our intention must be to dismantle inequity within those systems. I therefore propose that a model of collaboration designed, grounded in design justice could be the germ for emergent communities in which equitable human connections are both the means and the result of collaborative research, teaching, and learning. Thank you.